I want to welcome everyone to our Good After COVID-19 um, third webinar in Finland. Um, many of you know that this is uh, linked to the Good After COVID-19 global initiative um, that just recently had their seventh um, own fishbowl discussion. Um, and it has been very interesting to follow follow those discussions, but they are also very interested in in hearing what we're doing here in Finland and the Nordics in general. So so this has been a, a very um, very good thing. We have people here from around the world, which makes us very happy um, from many many different countries. Um, this is partly due to a lot of people's networks being very global. Um, this is also due to a lot of people being very interested in, in what goes on in the Nordic countries. So we are happy to see so many people from different countries around here. Um, we have an interesting set of program. We have um, Mikko Vesa from Hanken School of Economics, uh, who will have our opening speech and then we have Juha Grön who is the CEO of Atria uh, who will give some of his insights on, on Good After Covid. And as traditionally we also have Petri Laulajainen who will give some, um, some insights and some thoughts on, um, on the survey that was done with Hanken and, and Sprof to see what we can find around around leadership there and and for the for the autumn we have decided to talk about leadership because it has been raising a lot of good questions a lot of interest as well so so all of the topics during this autumn there will be a total of three webinars and all of them will be on on leadership some practicalities uh, the microphones and the videos of all participants are off and they are muted if you want to ask any questions, there's a raise hand function. You can use that one and I will be following all the time the participants. There's also the possibility to write something in the chat or in the questions and answers. We have Ahmed and myself who will be following the chat and the questions and answers closely. Um, you can also write private messages to me. My name is Tina Karme um, um, and if you have any questions or any concerns. And at the end of um, this session, we will again allow for a conversation and you can ask also for the permission to get your camera on or your microphone on. Uh, we ask no one to please share their screens because uh, it will make the technological part of all of this very complicated. So, so during, during the discussion part, um, you are allowed also to put the camera and, and unmute your microphones if you so want. Without further ado, I give the word to Kim, who is the CEO of SPROF for our foreword. Thank you, Tina. It's my pleasure to uh, open again the uh, COVID, Good After COVID-19 webinar. This is the third session and uh, it's a great pleasure to see that the number of participants is continuously growing and uh, we have also people from a huge variety of countries on the globe. Uh, we take this as, um, as a sign that uh, the Nordic leadership is inter interesting. So this is a, a very, very good to notice. In the first webinar, the main topic was how to lead virtual teams. In our second webinar, we focused on the role of communications to active, active, achieve commitment and innovations. And uh, now during the uh, autumn, we are going to focus on um, uh, responsible leadership in theory and in practice. In the survey, Sprof and Hanken completed among the Finnish large companies, it could clearly be seen that uh, sustainable business transformation through people is seen as the key to success. 
and uh, recent international studies confirm this also. That is why we have uh, chosen for the next three uh, webinars the topic of uh, responsible leadership. Today, as Dina mentioned, we have two very good speakers about the topic, both uh, on the theoretical side and on the practical side. So we are looking forward to listening to uh, the speeches and, and then uh, your questions further on. So thank you for all participants joining and supporting this initiative and welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kim. So I see that we have at least some people that have found the chat, which is good news. That's, that's a good thing. We will, without further ado, move on to um, Nikko Vesa. And I will, Mikko, now give you the host um, rights, which means that okay. you are the one who will be sharing the screen. Okay. And I'll All stop right. sharing here. All right. Uh, right. So welcome everybody to this webinar and thank you the, to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, if you're asked to give a keynote at nine o'clock in the morning on a Monday, you ask yourself what could possibly go wrong? Well, one thing did and that is that I tried to sort of put a background picture here with, you know, the official Hunkin logo and everything. And then when I turned it on, it turned out that the software edited away, not my skirt, but my entire face. So I'm still a bit undetermined whether this is actually a bug or a feature, but hey, maybe we'll find out. But hey, uh, I'll put on a PowerPoint now uh, to show a little bit of the ideas that I have around this question. Mm. Hold on, technology is toying with me. The air. Right. Okay, so the topic of today then is, is the question of leadership and COVID and myself being a strategy researcher, of course, I'm kind of asking myself the question of strategizing and COVID-19, what does this really mean? And I came up with this idea of talking about a number and I'll kind of show you how this number unfolds as, as, as I talk today. Uh, but um, I'm going to do, to, to do my talk on a kind of a pretty macro level, so I'm not actually going to go particularly much into the Finnish situation itself here, but I'm going to go through three components that I think are actually pretty central when one tries to understand what is happening to strategy. But first of all, uh, coming back to the general theme of the series, what is the link between strategy, good, and a pandemic? My understanding of these questions is pretty pragmatist. That is, I kind of tend to think that good is not a universal factor, rather it is uh, something that we strive for in, in, in particular places and times. And I think if we examine, for example, our response to the pandemic, we quite clearly see it is to give you an example. Uh, we have people who are talking a lot about public health and safety. And we have a lot of people who are talking about the health of the economy. And when we examine the pandemic, we realize that quite often there is actually an inherent conflict between public health and economic health. And we are also seeing almost on a weekly basis, how the balance between these are shifting. So both are trying to strive for good, but when we focus on different things, then different things become important. That means that good is also situated in what we do in our daily lives. And it's not in that sense, I think, an abstract and fixed ideal. Strategy becomes important here if we are trying to manage large organizations because strategy is pretty much the tools that we have at our disposal for trying to understand the future. And we make decisions with the idea that we want to accomplish something in the future. In a similar way, if you have an agenda, an agenda that you think is good, 
and you want to implement it, then strategy will be your friend because it will help you to understand the future in which you have to try to get your thing done. So the link to, make, to get back to good is this strategy is probably a, one of the your most important tools if you desire to accomplish good during or after the pandemic, depending exactly on how you see your, the pandemic itself. So that's the link, I think, between strategy and good. Strategy helps you to understand the world and you cannot really meaningfully try to act in a world that you cannot understand. Random chance, of course, might always help you, but it's not a very comforting thought. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about basically five different things. First of all, I'm going to have an introduction by looking at the historical case. So we're going to look at what was difficult times and different responses. Notice different responses. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about strategy and, and, and its connections to, 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 to turbulence. That's a pretty theoretical thing. Uh, I'm looking a little bit at our response to the, to the pandemic so far, and then get back to the wider megatrends in society. Because I think these three, when you take them together, actually answers bullet point number five, that is, what is your number? And I'm going to get to that, what I mean with the number uh, at that point. It's not a telephone number, but it's like a number that is a little devil that sits on your shoulder, if you like. And then some uh, concluding thoughts, maybe. Right. Um, so, I think one of the key things that we need to realize is that difficult situations are managed by accomplishing different solutions. And let's look back here. So uh, we go back to the 29th of October, 1929. We have a huge stock market crash on Wall Street that tri uh, triggers the period known as the Great Depression. The Great Depression is often considered the worst uh, microeconomic recession in modern times. And to give you some idea of what happened back then, because I suppose many of us might have forgotten, uh, between 1929 and 1932, global GDP shrank by 15%. And by 1933, global trade volumes had shrunk by two thirds. This is pretty incredible. Uh, such was the power of the shock that it uh, institutionalized the number of concepts in our heads that we still use today. Uh, the events and solutions and persons who defined the Great Depression became, uh, became iconic. We talk about Black Tuesday, uh, that is the day when the stock market crashed. We all know what the New Deal is, that is a new form of macroeconomic policy. Franklin D. Roosevelt become, became uh, the most iconic president in, 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 in US history because he gave a face to this solution. And also what the economics, econ in economics is known as counter-cyclical economic policy or Keynesian politics became prominent then. None of these existed prior to 1929. They were all specific policies designed to counter a specific crisis. Hence what I am going to say is that most likely when we are looking at what the world will be looking like after COVID-19, it's quite likely that we will have a similar setup of, of new concepts, perhaps pay places, phases, and policies that will help us forward from this day. Hidden in my thought is the undercurrent that I think is quite important. Do not assume that you can return back to the past. That is very unlikely and history doesn't support the idea that returning to the past is possible when you're faced with a majorly difficult situation. You will need new and different solutions that will probably come to define our societies for a generation or two to come. So that's just the backdrop to show kind of where we are. And I think the backdrop is important because if we look at how global GDP has shrunk during the Great Depression, we are already in a situation where the economy of major Western countries, United Kingdom, for example, 
have shrunk more than 15% in a matter of months. And well, is it going to get better soon? Well, we'll see. Anyways, that was the backdrop. If we look at this from a theoretical point of view, uh, we can talk about strategic turbulence. And I have put in this graphic here from my favorite, one of my favorite artists, the mathematician Escher, who was very famous for making these kind of paintings that play with the uh, Visual, uh, visual illusions, but there are two big ripples happening here, two big ripples in this picture that I want you to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, when you have genuine turbulence, strategy in a conventional manner becomes impossible. We have to keep in mind that strategy is a practice for times of moderate change. If you have a world in which nothing changes, you don't need strategy. The only thing you need to do is to optimize your operational performance. If you have a world in which you cannot know anything, that is the world of real turbulence, strategy in a conventional sense becomes equally impossible. And the reason for this is that, well, how can you possibly plan anything to a future which is such quicksand that it just dissolves around you? So typically strategy is for the world where things change moderately. So it's a medium change solution. Kind of. Now, when we are faced with strategic turbulence, a number of characteristics become important. First of all, conventional distinctions within markets and industries break down. Because nowadays, for example, if you say you're in the retail industry, or you're in uh, online marketing, you have a reasonably clear niche of what business you're in, right? When you're confronted with extreme turbulence, the boundaries of such markets and industries tend to disintegrate. That is, you no longer clearly know who maybe are your customers or your competitors, for example. These will change. Secondly, the larger macroeconomic and macro policy environment becomes uncertain and changing. So for example, lobby groups will struggle to have a clear impact in situations like this because you don't really know whom you're lobbying for or exactly whom should you even be lobbying. So in a similar way, there is this liquidification of the wider macroeconomic policy. The main effect of that is that it calls into question your current networks. And finally, so when you think about the small ripple of your own industry and the wider ripple of society, the boundaries between the two become blurred. So the common and shared ground between specific markets and the wider macroeconomy are in motion. The question becomes then what should we really do? And one of the things that theory kind of shows us is that under genuine strategic turbulence, success depends on collaborative strategizing among dissimilar industries and markets. And eventually, the new economy will stabilize into and around these new configurations that you have created. So these are often unconventional configurations. And the people who are able of spotting them and the organizations that are capable of implementing this will have what we in strategy calls call for a source of sustained competitive advantage. But these are going to be pretty hard to spot, especially if one is used to conventional strategic planning. So what becomes more important here then is I would say that rather than, for example, only calculating the uh, net present value of, of specific investments, for example. What becomes important now is to become very sensitive for a group of new uh, drivers and trends that are shaping, first of all, the macro environment, and thereby it's going to also define a lot of things that happens within specific industries and markets. Here, of course, the caveat is that not all industries and markets are equally affected. Uh, some are very strongly affected for good, such as online retailing. Some are very strongly affected for the bad, such as travel and tourism. And a number of industries are maybe somewhere in between. So change in that sense is never uh, equally distributed across an economy. 
But let's see at a few things here that I've been thinking about that I think become quite powerful in this new world that we're heading into. And these are what I call for COVID-19 based situational drivers. That is things that have popped up within the last year that we didn't really expect to be there. Well, we all know these, of course, because they affect our daily lives. First of all, uh, we have a huge array of, of government imposed medical rules, I have chosen to call them. Uh, in different countries, they are slightly different, but we know roughly what they are from social distancing to washing your hands to wearing facial masks to having to keep your kids uh, at home from school. And, and well, you know what it is like. Government imposed is the most important thing here to keep in mind. Secondly, we are seeing a absolutely massive monetary and fiscal stimuli package. This, I think, in an interesting way comes back to what I was talking about of the Great Depression earlier on, because uh, we are seeing something rather interesting here. Evident, for example, in, in the latest EU budget round, and that is we are getting conventional sort of 60s style direct stimuli becoming popular again. Ever since uh, the, the, the growth of abenomics in Japan, we have had an ongoing stimuli of the economy that has been monitoring, that is quantitative easing. But now we're also seeing direct government spending. So clearly uh, policy, policy makers are now trying to apply all the tools of the past into this situation. We don't know if that will be successful. And my example kind of says that maybe we have to come up with something else, but we are seeing massive monetary and fiscal stimuli at the moment. On top of that, we are seeing an, a, a myriad of everyday coping practices, such as us being here today and, and discussing these things online. And all of us have to cope on a daily basis in a way that we did not expect prior. All of these become, in my view, quite important drivers when we try to understand how the future will stabilize. On the macro level, three things become important. First of all, I think we are going to see the return of government. Governments have now for the first time in a long time used direct power to affect the daily lives of citizens. Hither though it has usually been indirect power, so such as tax cuts or, or taxation regimes or that kind of thing that you know, you don't directly feel like there would be a hand on your shoulder. Governments are now stronger and they're more accustomed to using direct power. This has not been the trend since, I would say the 1980s. And I think it's coming back. Once they got, once governments get used to using power, they will be more comfortable doing so in the future. A lot of business people won't like this, but I think this is going to happen. The second thing that we are of course seeing here also is national decision, national level decision making is gaining force. It is kind of sad, but it's true. So we are seeing that uh, both the medical rules, travel restrictions, uh, probably purchase of, of potential vaccines, most of these are being dealt with on a national level. That is of course partly because the structures to do so exist there. But at the same time, of course, this is kind of sad because uh, COVID-19 could have been a massive sort of stimuli for global collaboration because I think this is probably the first time since the founding of the United Nations that humanity has a common crisis that we all need to solve, but we are not really seeing a lot of the common solving yet at least. So I think national, the national level decision making coupled with stronger governments is certainly one, strength, one thing that we get from the COVID. And the third one is the rehybridization of macroeconomic tools, and that is probably going to then result in a shift of how we do uh, macroeconomic planning. These, of course, are all mediated also by the fact that we have this myriad of everyday coping practices that we all do that will mean that we are not going to emerge out of the situation the way we were before, simply because all of us, all of us have learned new skills and developed new preferences. It is a practical link, <clears throat> I think, to employment policy. So organizations that are capable of, of, of catering for talent that uh, has found new ways of working through this enforced coping 
will probably be again in a stronger position for, for recruiting key talent. These all then will shape the new post-COVID economy that will stabilize at some point. But, and here comes a caveat. Uh, Milton Friedman famously observed that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. So even if we have drivers that come from the pandemic, possibly the biggest effect of the pandemic itself will be that it acts as a catalyst for everything that was bubbling under just prior to the catalyst. So in some ways we invent new configurations by using a lot of the sort of weak signals, the small building blocks that were out there in the economy even, even, even prior to the crisis. And here, I think these four things that I have listed here are things that all of you will be familiar with. So we are seeing now a return of geopolitics. It's been gone since the fall of the Soviet Union, but certainly the escalation of, of, of bad fate or even hostility, for example, between the United States and the People's Republic of China is a good example of how geopolitics will start to affect the economy, even to the point of, of single companies being sanctioned, such as Trump's campaign against Huawei. And if it happens once, then likely it will happen again. So that might mean something as shocking as global companies actually having to decide at some point where do you want to be? Do you want to be in the US sphere or do you want to be in the Chinese sphere? And I think the EU is trying to strike out a third leg here, but let's see if they succeed. We are seeing for the first time in a really long time, uh, radically promising technology. What I mean with this is of course, what we all know as, know as AI, artificial intelligence. We've had a lot of technological change happening in the, in the world in the last 20, 30 years, we all know that. But I don't think this has been radically promising technology. What people are talking about when it comes to AI today is similar to what people were talking about when we had a man on the moon. I mean, sort of technology with alien capabilities. And that's something we have now. And, and artificial intelligence is certainly being used to sort of shape and talk about how the future will be. We have new, we have new ecologism sort of uh, consciousness of the, of the problem of, the, of, of, of climate change, uh, of, 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 of uh, biological extinction. These will shape our, our consumption patterns and this will get more quick now. And uh, here again, I think tourism and travel really, really need to think about how they're going to adapt to this new change. Because I think even when the world begins to open up, there will be no going back to the previous. And we are going to see new populism and we're going to see forms of populism, I think across every single political movement that we have. So we are going to have new populism with the populists but we're also going to have populism within conservative parties, liberal parties, green parties, and labor parties as we go future, into, into the future. This will become stronger. And thus we come to kind of my concluding point. What is your number and why does it matter? So I have made a simple formula. Look at the situational drivers of COVID-19 times the power of emergent megatrends times your capacity for new collaborative strategizing. And this way you will get an abstract number through which you can understand how heavily is this, is, is this change impacting you and your organization. What does this number then represent? First of all, it represents a knowledge gap. If this number feels like really big, it means we feel a lot of uncertainty regarding the future. But at the same time, uncertainty means that there's going to be a large opportunity space for doing good. That means you are not locked down. You have the possibility to do some real strategy. Very often organizations do not. Uh, Noble economist uh, William and Oliver Williamson used to say that most companies can't do strategy and even those who can shouldn't because it's just damn expensive. So if you try to change the world, most likely you'll just burn a lot of money. But 
when things are sort of radically destabilized, there is the opportunity to do some real strategy. That being said, please remember the following. Change in society and, and, and the economy is always highly unevenly distributed. This number will be larger for some organizations than others. Remember that change is not binary. It's not a yes or no question. It's, 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 it's a gradual uh, thing and it is always present. That means everything you do, every single practice in your organization is going to be affected by this change incrementally over time. Don't think you can sort of outrun it or outsmart it. And remember finally that when societies and people start to change their behaviors, they most likely do so by picking up things and bits and pieces that already exist in the world. So in that way, even radical change can feel threatening, but it's actually built up of Legos that we have kind of seen lying around already. So it's not that bad. So finally, my point is this, when you think about this number, what is its point? The point is that you should have this little devil on your shoulder that always says your number. So whenever you're making a decision, ask your number, is this a sustainable solution to make or not? And that is my question for all of you. What is your number? Thank you, Mikko. Very interesting viewpoints. And I will for sure at least try to count my number. Hopefully it's a small one. The following person we have speaking is Juha, and Juha also already turned his camera on, and I think that I could hear some, some sound from him as well, so everything seems to be working. And Juha oh, is, yes, and Juha is the CEO of, of Atria, and without further ado, I'll actually let you introduce yourself. Thank you, thank you Tina, and it's great honor to, to share this experience is uh, what we have got concerning COVID-19. And uh, uh, first of all, I start shortly wrapping up what's Atria. It's Atria's food company turnover, net sales roughly 1.5 billion euros. And, and net net result is roughly 25 million. So our, our, our profitability in that business is not, not very high. We are so-called low, low margin business. And we are operating in Northern Europe, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Russia, Estonia. And then we, have, of course, we have some exports outside our home base. Our product categories, we have meats, pork, beef, chicken, turkey, meat products. Uh, convenience food, hot dog concept, and uh, animal feed. And uh, roughly our monthly sales, sales food, edible food, is 25,000 tons per month. That's Atria. And uh, <coughs> in our business, food business, luckily we are in business where this, this uh, total volume is quite solid. Uh, we need food every day, and and uh, and uh, what's what's uh, changing? It's uh, changes between categories and between challenges where we sell and where where our consumers are, are buying their food. And uh, as we know that now we are more or less eating buying food from retail, and and this food service sector has been struggling quite quite heavy during this COVID COVID case. And this, I'll go through shortly how these things has proceeded until now, since March. And, and it's exciting that this phenomenon, how consumers are, people are behaving, it's very similar. It's not depending on, on country, not, not on, on, on our, our wording, VA, everywhere it's quite similar behavior. End of March, we had Harding session. People were buying and filling themselves, and one lesson to learn is that the households does, that they don't have any stocks. They they don't have stocks on themselves, so that they they went to the, to the hypermarkets or, or supermarkets and, and bought bought to fill their, their stocks. And uh, as as we know that that uh, the supply chain. From, from the field to the, the cells of, of con consumers, it is quite empty, so that everyone, everyone wants to keep their stocks low, so that there, this adaptation for the, the increasing demand is not, not 
very good on that sense that, that we do, don't have stocks. Our financial directors are guiding us to reduce the stock levels and, and we have done it in the whole, whole chain. And uh, after this, this hardening period, April, two weeks, the end of March was, was sales was, was fantastic. We were, we were having a lot of forwards on work and high costs to, to, to supply and following demand. But, but April, we, we didn't sell very well. April and mid, until mid-May was, was very weak sales. For example, uh, food service indexes, they were even under 50 compared to the previous year. Retail has been growing, indexes were roughly 110, but, but it couldn't cover the losses in, in food service sector. Uh, Mid-May, uh, demand side started to, to normalize, and uh, this restriction was a little bit easier for the place replaced by, by governments and, and people started to travel and move on local level and, and uh, uh, until mid-May May, uh, demand has been quite good but uh, restaurants and public sector is still uh, has been quite close and, and our customers are predicting, forecasting that uh, that uh, it takes at least two years to reach that level on, on food service sector we had in 2019. So that that uh, it's possible that that food food service sector won't ever be like like it has have used to be in, in the last last years, because uh, food service has been the fastest growing cut the segment in, in, in food business. But it seems that, that uh, now, now at, at least it's, it's very, very shaky what, what happened to food service. Uh, summer season for, for Atria, this barbecue season is very important and it was quite nice. As, as an example, uh, in Finland, which is a small country, but we, we had over 300,000 people more in Finland during summertime than the year before. Of course, of course this tourism, tourism to, to Southern Europe has taken hard hit so that, that 300,000 people only in Finland and local, local home, home based market gives a lot of potential to sell more. And, and we saw that in our, our numbers. Uh, and and what what's the big big issue for for us is is that what will be the disposable incomes developed in the future now now until until now the the demand has been quite good and and uh, this disposable in, incomes has not decreased yet but but if unemployment start to increase we will also get hit but uh, uh, according to our experience this hit is not not in the volume it's it's hit to the categories people start to eat cheaper food and 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 uh, it can cause challenges to us if if we are if our average prices start starts to decrease and it also means that margin starts to decrease but but until now uh, situation is quite quite good then uh, uh, what we are thinking, how we have behaved in, in, in Atria. First rule is, is minimize damage. Anyway, your business has been damaged because you can't fully implement all these operational things and de uh, development actions you have planned. So that you will get some damages and, and some of your customers are in, in trouble and, and so on, but, but you need to minimize damages. So that, that keep your people healthy. Do everything to avoid that you will, won't get that, that virus in your factories and, and, and uh, your, your, that so that your organization is in good, good shape. 
so that that uh, we have taken actions which are more more demanding that that uh, which are placed the governments so that that comp i think that companies will have huge responsibility to avoid the spreading that virus because because at least uh, maybe hopefully i'm i'm wrong again but but it seems that government doesn't have any any more so much power than they they used to used to have in the springtime so that that companies and and this this uh, business operators need to take more responsibility then uh, take care of of your factories and and the key processes as as normally order and sales process need to be in good shape if you won't get orders there are you won't have cash flow so sub supply chain guarantee that you have spare parts you have, have additives you have spices so on take care of your supply chain invoicing without invoicing you don't have have cash flow and and financing so that that you secure that you have money to to play and and in the march normally our our, our cash level is very low now we have only few million euros in our, our cash but we increased our cash cash 35 million in, in, in one week when, when this COVID crisis started now we have, have reduced the cash level to normal 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 status uh, you can you can put stiffer rules to your organization that, that governments can put on place so that utilize that and and uh, it give give some trust even trust to, to, to you and, and the business if, if the rules are strict they have to be fair but but people understand very well that that why why these rules are, are stiffer than normally and uh, basically this this uh, or in the end this this virus is terrible because it's fatal in the worst case and and uh, that that gives certain certain freedom to to put these stiff rules and and uh, maybe maybe the first third thing of, of all of the of course fatal it's fatal disease in the first, worst case but but there are no guarantee when this this uh, crisis is over so that that uh, in communication point of view you can't tell lies to your your staff Please don't, don't over over communicate. They are they people are clever and they they can that in that status they can get a lot of information you know, on 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 media and, and the internet and so on. So that that the uh, lies and, and stupid stories are not not very clever to tell. So that that uh, don't over over communicate and and. Uh, but the uh, organization need to have feeling and, and trust that the top management is, is at the place. So that, uh, that it, it does not need to communicate every, every day or, at, or, or every week either. Actually, in, in our case, we, we were talking quite a lot, lot in our, our local top management team, teams that, that should, should we communicate more at the beginning of, of this crisis but uh, but our our blue collars they took took risk, huge responsibility and and we thought that that let them do have that responsibility and, and uh, it's better to give give guidance or, or take bigger role it's needed let them let them work and and we were quite quite quiet actually some some weeks when when we need to need to go this this special special mode, mode. then uh, in the daily daily management uh, now it's time to concentrate to, to normal things don't start to make miracles keep everything calm because because now this external external threat and, and crisis is, is big enough to, now it's not time to to make internal crisis now it's important to concentrate on the daily daily operations and keep people and, and organization calm don't start over difficult projects it's very difficult to drive because we need to have zooms and teams and and 
in our case, we, we started group strategy project, which was mo uh, November last year, and, and our original plan was drive that process so that it would be to, to be ready in, pre ready in in June, but, but it has taken more time and now actually right now we are finalizing the strategy. And uh, in, in practice our manage, management team, group management team, we had we had face-to-face -face meeting in February and, and then we have had face-to-face -face meeting meeting in August. So so that we have been half year working via via Teams or, or Skype. So that that, that uh, in, in in that sense, these fantastic tools are not the best ones for for the most demanding demanding pro, uh, projects. Then uh, we have we have thought so that that uh, don't postpone things. We have not postponed investments. We have postponed annual meetings. We have not not postponed the payment of dividends. We have, have tried to to implement implement meant everything according to original time frame or time plan. And then when the times will be normal, normalized, what we have planned to do is, is, is uh, check the, the performance of, of your organization. Now they have been in remote work mode half year and, and we have decision to, to continue that remote work until end of, of year, but of course we, if there is possibility to, to normalize situation, we do do that. But but now now that we are, are, are informed that, that we will continue remote working until end of, of the year, so that that uh, it was the original plan was that that uh, we would have our organization or, or white collars at the place. In, in the August, but unluckily, this the second wave or uh, so the discussion is second wave wave on or what what the status is like right now. But anyway, we couldn't gather our our stuff at the same place, and 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 uh, we don't know exactly what's the performance level in our our organization now. It would be extremely important to. To, to see our individuals and check how they do and how they feel. And uh, there is, is risk that, that all of our, our employees are not in the best shape. And uh, I'm afraid that, that all of, of our, our people can't continue. They have, they have, they have done before. So that, that uh, this, this crisis has given very hard hit for some individuals, and this has to be checked. And and uh, there's interesting phenomenon that that now this this the, the key players just now they are, are very operative people. In the normal normal situation, the the specialists they have big big role and and. Uh, they are maybe the key players, but now they are this this uh, very very operational players, and and let's see that what will happen when things are not normal normalized. Then meet your customers, and and uh, just now this this traditional customer relationships are very very important because because this this restrictions to travel and, and meet people makes very difficult to find new customers. So that that old co-operators and and uh, uh, old customers they are very very val valuable. And uh, the first thing to do when when things are normalized, please meet your customers and and put and also top management has to participate at that tournament. And uh, then. Uh, start or, or continue this management development activities, especially the young, young generation has to be uh, trained. And, and to, this remote working mode is very bad for youngsters because they, they should, should uh, be able to learn how to, how to 
work together, how what's what means we we all work in, in teams and now they are, are at home. That's, that's not good. Then don't start crazy traveling. There is, is a lot of lot of need to travel and and, uh, and fix everything we have, have lost in, in these these months so that, that uh, please control what what are happening when when things are normalized and uh it might be even so that that the top management could uh, or press break pedal that that there are some some delays in projects and activities so that that when when uh, forces are at the place there is also risk that that there are too many balls in the air and and uh, some of those balls are not needed and, and we need to postpone or, or, or even forget some some project and uh, remote work at least in atria we will get rid of that as soon as possible possible as as a normal working mode of course it's sometimes it's very very efficient and and uh, nice way to work but but uh, there need to be we need at, me, at least we have the period when when white collars are at the place we actually you ha have a good question here from one of the participants um, who says that while we are focusing the negative aspects and threats caused by covid uh, he's curious to know how you would see the potential upsides and opportunities in these situations and if you have any thoughts on who could be the winner a lot of lot of possibilities they're simplifying i think things are moving faster they simplified there is is the projects which are not necessary to implement there's a lot of lot of potential but but uh, to to utilize these these opportunities you need need to avoid situations you damage your existing business so that that you need to have this this uh, solid solid backbone or frame to, to develop so that, that that has to be kept in, in good shape of course there is this potential and and but uh, there is of course like like online online business the food food sector has as cross per, per percentage but it's heavily but it's still quite small business so, but but uh, there's of course there's huge huge potential and 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 uh, as as normally the the best companies can can utilize the situation and yes. uh, I'm I'm worried about the, these companies which has just just started startups to, to create creating new businesses and they don't have a role on the market at, at least we have seen that that it's quite difficult to launch novelties at the moment. And, and a, a company, company like Atria, which is quite quite solid role on the market, but but now everyone is is just now it's playing playing safety, and and uh, I'm I'm sure that there will be the day that that uh, the risk taking will will increase. We also have another question, which was around what happened quite in the beginning of of the COVID-19 crisis when people were hoarding toilet paper but also food but how did this affect them and uh, of course there was a lot of hysteria and other uh, negative things around this but were there something positive also uh, that you could see out of this? This, this uh, big variation demand side is not good for us. <laughs> on its that, that it's uh, we prefer situations that we can predict our 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 volume development. But but of of course, if if we can find some positive thing that that the demand was was concerned towards the daily daily foods and, and it's very very traditional foods where, where it's uh, our strength is there so that that there was means there was also chicken stripes and so on and and uh, that's good for for us but uh, of of course one maybe one positive thing is in that, that organization can test their limits so that that it's it's uh, good for them to drive as as hard as possible sometimes it's good to test that how, fa how fast you can run normally it's quite quite calm anyway so that that of course there's daily daily challenges but 
and and uh, demand variations day by day, but but uh, sometimes it's good to test that what we can perform. Uh, one thing is clear that it's recovering will take time, uh, and uh, no who no one knows how long does it take. So that that keep your organization ready to 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 meet, meet that challenge that uh, that. Uh, some businesses will be lost and, and there are new op opportunities, but recovering will take time. Simplify things, don't make miracles, use these remote working tools and, and, and it's sure that, that the tools to, tools, these tools will be improved a lot in coming years. Take care of especially your, your young generation. This 90 90 beginning 1990 we had had quite very difficult situation in Finland huge unemployment rate and somehow so we even lost not a whole generation but a lot of, of potential were lost on, on these these years we, we were struggling in Finland and and uh, I'm sure, sure that that that's the risk not only in Finland but all 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 countries and uh, then take care of your customers and consumers so that there is, 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 they are paying the bills so that these old connections has to be taken care of. And uh, we are thinking so that, uh, that we will be the winner in this game because we have good, good uh, background, good solid, solid performance uh, one advantage we have, we, we have very experienced management and uh, I'm not, I'm not, not you have grown, I have been working too long time in Atria, but in general we have, we have a very experienced man, management and, and maybe uh, we need to also consider the situation and we'll find out what, what will happen, but all of us can't, can't find the new, new working mode when, when this crisis is, is over, so that, that also new, new blood is needed in our organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are some other questions as well, but we will probably return to those once we, once we get to the panel discussion. Thank you, Juha, so much for your valuable and interesting insights. We will then move on to Petri Laulajainen and the survey that was made between um, Hanken School of Econ Economics, Academic Business Consulting and SPROF. And uh, we have picked out bits and pieces throughout these webinars and, and this time we're looking if there are signs of change within leadership from the survey and, and without too much introduction I'll give the word to you Petri. Thank you Tina. Uh, it was very interesting to hear Mikko talk about uh, what is your number um, the situational drivers times emergence mega trends time collaborative strategizing. So that, that comes a little bit about from the survey. So we divided the survey on two different parts. First, the short-term impact of COVID-19, and then a little bit the longer-term effect of megatrends on industry. So um, we had the survey, we started 27th of March, and then we finished the survey on the first week of May. So we've seen the impact of COVID-19 on spring, and then we've been discussing with many executives between spring and this autumn, and there are signs of change and possibilities. So the question is, can companies find the opportunities from the change? And as Mikko talked, <laughs> we're asking, what is your number? So let's go a little bit about on the survey. So Hanken School of Economics and Sprof, we carried out the survey on the impact of COVID-19 on actual companies and then 
the longer to make a trends effect on the industry. We send the questionnaire for the CEOs and senior management of 400 Finland's largest companies. And then we received 85 responses. Uh, we interviewed 12 executives to obtain more details of the specific impact the COVID-19 and the forces of change put to their companies. And between the spring and this autumn, we've had quite many discussions with executives and how they see that the, in three months, how the situation has changed and where they are heading. And then also Hunkin published a white paper on the subject. And that was more based on different industries. How did that COVID-19 change different industries? Did they see uh, different impacts on different industries? So thank you very much, Janina Airikainen and Alexandra Strandval, who did complete the Hankin white paper. So the company's views on the impact. The coronavirus was very rapid. And also Mick was talking about the pandemics that we haven't had quite large pandemic that will affect the whole world since 1929. And the COVID-19 that was very rapid. Every company was affected. So a little bit more about the impacts, how the companies saw the situation last spring. So the responses to the survey show that the short-term effects of the coronavirus on firms, they were most affected by the uncertainty. They were not really capable of making uh, decisions. Where do we go from here? What is our focus? So, so that was a little bit like paralysis. If, if companies not really sure about the markets, they don't know where to develop. And, and it, it's good that different companies, like Juha was talking about Atria, they didn't paralyze. They did go forward according to the development plan. And that's very good. But some companies, they couldn't really cope with the change. So, so many companies saw that nearly half of the turnover was gone and they were into surviving mode. And also that um, they had to adjust the operations to falling demand. Um, the Confederation of Finnish Industries, EK or ECO, they published same time when we did this survey April 16, uh, and, and they saw, or the answers to their survey was that the companies in Finland, that turnover collapsed in Finnish employer companies, especially in the service industries and smaller businesses. And more than half of the companies stated that they need financial support. And even further, so 36% of Finnish employer companies reported that the turnover was at least half lower than normally in April. So that's very huge impact. And then that caused that 44% of employers made temporary layoffs. So situation was a bit difficult. But what they saw that the personal, they had to go largely to telecommuting. So virtual teams were built. They were trying to make the technology and, and operations to work with the um, people uh, trying to communicate on their home sofas or on their kitchen tables. So many companies that they processes were not fine-tuned in virtual teams. Um, and that caused big problems. And one of the big topics in the future will be still how to manage virtual teams and how, how you virtually lead different peoples in different places. Um, 
So the key, I think, is leadership. You have to adapt your leadership skills and then empower people. But still, some companies have more problems. Some companies are already taking like tiger leads on digitalization and they, they just adjusted their structures to, the, to meet the so-called new normal. We don't know what the new normal is, but it's continuous change before we have uh, vaccines and we get rid of the COVID-19. So then also investing in cash flow management, streamlining, streamlining processes and change leaderships are the key measures among the respondents. So you couldn't really meet the customers anymore. You had to go through internet. So, but even uh, there are companies that are in the middle of a crisis. Some respondents saw that they are opportunities to increase their market share. So there are very good potential the change brings opportunities. And the couple of um, issues with continuity plans, there were only less than 5% who did not do any continu continuity plans. But most of the companies did certain levels of continuity plans. And there were some like 21% that despite the uncertainty, they were focusing on making longer term plans. And like uh, Juha was talking about, you have to continue the development, otherwise you will fall behind. So how they saw after the COVID-19, they had to do the surviving mode, but how they saw the future, how they see the changes, mega trends, the forces of change, how that, does that affect the industry? So they can start to plan uh, the next steps. And when we go to the most important forces, every company nearly said that the technological development, let's say more digitalization, are changing the business structures, even the role of players and business models. So what you need is to have your organizational structure to develop plans how we utilize all these new tools or are we just trying to cope with the change also what they saw was that the business are innovating they are not really staying stagnant businesses are forming networks and like uh Mick was talking about collaborative strategizing. So how you build your network that, that your value chain becomes more like a value network. That brings you the advantage to other companies who are trying to go back to the normal, the basic business that they used to have before the COVID-19. But I think the change is here to stay. So we need to think new ways to make more value. And of course, the economic downturn is causing reorganization or re reorganization of all your processes and business models. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is um, negative change, but I think this is more positive change that the global warming and other environmental factors are changing the attitudes, expectations, and behavior of uh, consumers and companies have to respond to that and make a more sustainable future. So I think that's one good issue from this crisis. You have to do sustainable business to survive. The agility to respond. That, that, that's a bit hard when you think about it. But agility to respond to change demands, that creates pressure to business processes. So business processes are not very agile and you have to adjust your business processes to rapid changes of uh, demand. 
and, and in many organizations and for example of production sites your business processes are not very agile so the biggest issue in customer interface is how you respond to the demands that might be going up and down in a very short intervals and then second um, we were talking about with the interviews they stated that consumers are becoming more and more impulsive today so so how you pressure your business to do responsible production and sustainability and then product pricing might go up and down based on the demand from the market. Uh, so when we talk about the platforms, the forces of change that will increase competition in platforms and ecosystems. So actors in different industries can combine the way they offer and create entirely new entities and services. So more than 50% of companies feel that this will affect the industry. Uh, so to maintain competitiveness, companies need to build more agile business processes and they need to think where are the value, not value chains, but value networks that we can utilize and use the chains to increase our value and of course maybe new innovation products through other platforms and ecosystems we're talking about new market entries from global players i was talking with uh, insurance executives and in in europe there are quite many new players for example ikea is entering insurance market they have huge pockets and I think they have very large customer base. So, so they are bringing with some major uh, insurance company, basic insurance services with low price, and that will have a huge impact on, on, on traditional in, uh, insurance companies. So you have to be prepared that there are some major players from other industries and that also affects in your active pricing how you react on changing demands and customer sensitivity to switch to new options if traditional companies can't change their service so there are quite many uh, effects on customer interfaces and companies need to adapt new ways of working and using the digital digitalization and new tools and when we go to the next slide we can see that companies are very well monitoring and following closely the challenges on their um, interface with customers so so there's let's say that more than half of the companies say that they are monitoring it extremely well or very well. But when we go into analyzing the current business processes, can they meet the challenge posed by the forces of change? The picture is a bit different. So less than half said that they are not very well meeting the change, average or poorly. So, and when we went through different industries, some industries are meeting the challenge better than the others. That's obvious. And then the organizational structures of different industries are not well prepared to respond to the challenges and bringing like new competencies and capabilities that how you react, how you can put your business processes more agile what's your organizational capabilities to introduce new digital ways of working? How does that impact your whole organizational structure, roles and responsibilities? 
that's a big question. And, and the rapid change makes your organization, if it's too stagnant, you're trying to follow, you're trying to survive. But if you want to have the competitive edge, you need to build your organizational capabilities to the uncertainty of the future and be prepared to utilize your network to get the skills and capabilities if your own organization doesn't have it. What kind of expertise is needed to take advantage of the opportunities? Mikko was also talking about the number. What is your number? So then what is the knowledge gap that you can utilize your opportunities in the change? And, and where are the biggest challenges for companies? So the biggest issue was still the agility, how to influence your business processes so you can respond to the changing demands. And that's not very, very easy to do. And then more than 63%, they need understanding how to make digitalization and how to make robotics or uh, artificial intelligence to help companies to automate their processes and reduce costs. And then more than half said that they need capabilities to develop innovative products or services and of course the change management. And I think that's the key. When we talk about leadership, we talk about new ways of working, better tools. The key is how you can implement the sustainable change and how you can measure the progress that you are going in the right way. And that will be a key issue in every situation. The leadership that will give people in the middle of uncertainty, certain straight goals and targets. When we think about what happened between the last spring when COVID came and, and this summer and autumn, so we, we've been talking a lot about people, about the executives, that how they survived the hard spring and how they see the future. And it's still a bit uncertain. Uh, companies say that they, their customers are not really well equipped to tell them after six months they are working mostly on three months periods. What kind of demand you have? It's uncertain. It depends. Do we see that the next wave of COVID-19 is coming this autumn? And that's causing the uncertainty. Um, I was talking with a large company or very diversified company who have different uh, portfolios. They have uh, shipyards, they have mines, they have windmills. And we were talking about the leadership and, and the value of the company. And he was saying that it's a bit hard for, for the market to see the true value because they are so diversified. And, and it's, again, the value of the company in the market, it's not the tangible assets. I think it's two thirds of the value is the market trust or the vision of the leadership of the company. And that, that's bringing the value on your stock. And already in 2006, I was talking uh, with Sandy Org who was the HR president of Unilever. And he's, he told me about what's the effect of leadership on your market value. He said he had the best speech he had in late 90s. And when I asked him, so how did it go? So he, he told me about the background. In 90s, Unilever and Procter and Campbell we're having a huge fight of the market shares. And when Unilever made $1 of profit, the market valued that with $2. Oh, sorry, $1. But when Procter & Gamble made $1, the market valued that $2. And Unilever was thinking about how our $1 is only 
and they Procter and Gamble is having double that value in their market share. And they started to build the whole organizational structure. They took levels away, they streamlined their leadership skills, their whole leadership structure. And then Sandy Oak gave the speech in New York stock markets. And how well did it go? Next day, the value of the company went up nearly $1 billion. So I think leadership is key issue. How you build your company in uncertain times, you have to build straight picture where you want to go, what are the actual ways how you want to go there, and then build the people to take the leadership on their own work. So that, that was just a, a small sales for, for how we see the change of the future will happen. Nick was also talking about what happens in the market now. There's massive monetary and fiscal stimulus in states and in Europe too. And, and I think we are in the middle of discussing what are the European Union's recovery fundings and states are drafting the national plans, how to use the funds. And I think the round will go till October. And the estimates are still that Finland will get 3 billion euros to be invested. So uh, the Confederation of Finnish Industries, ECO, they proposed certain major investments should go to advance digitalization and sustainability. So, so the recovery funds, according to ECO, should go into renewable, renewable energy solutions and then new technologies and low carbon investments, and then promoting digitalization and supporting infrastructure. So in Finland's leading corporations to COVID-19 crisis, that there were certain initiative preparation for billion euro investments in digitalization and green transition. So that, that, that was by Pekka Lundmark. He used to be the CEO of Fortum, and now he's uh, CEO of uh, Nokia Corporation and also chairman of board in the Confederation of Finnish Industries. So they put a shared vision where they are building cooperation aim to billion euro investment into digital customer and service, industrial processes, productivity, remote work, and climate solution. So, so uh, it's very important that you are not building the existing normal businesses, that you are building better future. And you need to invest also into sustainability. A couple of things just uh, when Mick was talking about how to build your number. So a couple of words, you can choose and analyze the mega trends that are affecting your industry. So utilize your opportunities. How does it influence your line of business effects of your customer? And what are the requirements for business? And then the knowledge gap what new competencies and skills your organization needs to deliver. It's all about strategies, but you need to build your picture and your number that where you want to go. So, so there are existing methodologies for making sense of the future, and you need to maybe develop your existing tools and create new tools to support the change. So, Changes in environment change our business and how companies are prepared and can they turn changes into opportunities is very a key factor for future success. Thank you, Dina. No worries and sorry for having to cut you off a bit. <laughs> no worries, it's no. <laughs>
So we will now move into the discussion and we have already received a lot of good questions. If all we actually have a good question to Mikko. Okay. Mikko, you mentioned that you've been working as a consultant, so now you're gonna have to live with the consequences. <laughs> okay. um, the question is around uh, how do you see that artificial intelligence is changing the world of consulting? Well, I need to try to keep myself short there. Uh, artificial intelligence for me is two things in one concept. First of all, there is the actual technology. And of course, uh, that is the main dimension uh, of probably consulting work uh, in IT systems going forward. But that's pretty straightforward for anybody who is kind of a system specialist. The second thing that is important is for management consulting. And I think the artificial intelligence is becoming a language of change. That is, a lot of the changes that is happening in the world will be justified because AI this does this or AI does that. So being able to kind of talk uh, the kind of change language to artificial intelligence is going to be important for that kind of business. But these are two different things. There's a, there's a, this, there is an actual technology that works today. And then there is a pretty futuristic debate about what will be. So depending if you're a system specialist or a management consultant, you have to master one of these two. Yes. And actually a follow-up question on this, we'll do it so that we'll go with Juha first, then uh, comments from Petri and then comments from Mikko. And if Kim feels that he wants to add something, he can add, add at the end. But the question is that um, as the COVID-19 seems to be a good catalyzer for digital transformation. And we are at the same time, many claim that we're experiencing the fourth industrial revolution um, that for example, in Asia, in some cases might have been going further with having robotics, um, taking care of healthcare for elderly people or so. Um, how do you see that the organizations are coping with this fourth in the industrial revolution and the artificial intelligence that Nick also was recently talking about? We'll let Juha go first. Uh, in Atria, we have, we have invested a lot of, of money to robotics and automatization. So that, that uh, one thing where we have a lot of place to room still is, is follow-up systems and, and this, this uh, when we have a lot of basic data, what does it really mean to, to us and, and our markets? That's, that's maybe the biggest, biggest thing to do. But this uh, robotization, there we are, in, in, at least in, in the Nordic country in general, we are in quite good position and we have, we have a know-how and understanding. What does it mean to us? Petri? Yeah, I've been discussing with many companies who said that the digitalization, they already started it, but the whole COVID-19 like rapidly make them to, to install it to all of their processes, that they have big problems. But after that, they saw that this is the new normal. And, and like with insurance companies, that they are rapidly uh, digitalizing the manual processes and repetitive uh, actions on back offices and and even one insurance insurance company is already thinking can can we do everything online using digitalization and and one question for for how to cope with that changes in technology is how you analyze the analytics is key word what you are analyzing. So, mm. so there's a huge big data, but you need to be focused on mm. what we replace with the new methods and digitalized tools. You, you, you are not making new uh, business processes, you are adjusting them, and then, then you need more skills on the actual digitalization. So, so even the roles, and responsibilities in organization might change. Yes. Mikko. Okay. I was talking about the resurgence of geopolitics. And I think that one area where we will see this is exactly in artificial intelligence. 
So when the Trump administration is trying to control, for example, Huawei, at the background there, there is a struggle for who gets to control the AI future in reality. And very clearly we are seeing, I think, geopolitics generating three different development trajectories for artificial intelligence technologies. There is a US trajectory, which is focused on competitiveness. There is a Chinese trajectory, which is focused on control. And there is probably an attempt at the European direction, which is focused more on, I think, then corporate social responsibility. And at the moment, I think Europe is lagging behind in this struggle. And that seems to be also the reason why nobody really bothers to fight with us in this question. So I think this is this, this is situation at the moment. We are slightly lagging behind certainly China and Japan and probably the US as well. But what AI means is difficult because different expectations are loaded into the technology. Good. Kim, do you have some comments you want to make? Uh, yes, uh, I think this is just a, perhaps even a bigger uh, question than, than just uh, automation. As you have was telling, uh, people are going back to the safe uh, solutions, back to the old where, uh, when something happens. And uh, here we have a contradiction. People want to go back to the old ways. And on the other hand, we have a need to find new solutions. Uh, finding, uh, using uh, automation as one of the solutions is, of course, coming. It has been coming for a long time. Now it's forced to come str more strongly. But I think people are afraid of the new. So, so that is a contradiction. And, and, uh, it's not the only contradiction in, in when we talk about the uh, uh, COVID-19 effects on us. And, and that's why I feel it's a good topic to talk about the good after COVID. Um, in order to wrap all of this up, as we are um, also talking about leadership and this artificial intelligence and the um, fourth industrial revolution is an interesting topic. Um, there's a good question basically say asking that who is leading is the artificial intelligence or these kind of uh, big data models data gatherings uh, leading or do we actually have people in charge of where we're heading if we could go um, we'll go in the same order you have first and Petri then and Pitko and then Kim gets to wrap up the discussion and I'll give some final words after that. Yeah, the one issue is that when we talk about the new technology, who's leading it, that sometimes the top management, they let the ICT expert take the lead that what kind of a system we will build in. And that shouldn't be the way. They should be focused that what they would like to achieve with the new tools. And they have very clear focus and very clear follow up that are we doing the right things that will help the business processes. We are not building business processes to put into new technology. So the leadership should be clear. What is the end result of utilizing the new technology, not utilize the technology and see what happens. So humans are leading, but technology is, is not completely outside of it. Mikko. This is an incredibly difficult question because it has so many right answers. First of all, if we are looking at something like big data analysis, its value depends, I think, to some extent on the overall speed of change in society. Big data analyzes things from the past even if it is very recent past. Now, if people behave today exactly like they behaved yesterday, that is very valuable data. If they behave differently, its value diminishes. But the question is, what does it mean to lead? So if we look at AI, for example, I think on a policy level, probably Europe leads in the question of trying to accomplish a good life. So on a policy level, we're strong. 
But on a technological level, I don't think we are that strong. So lead can have many different uh, dimensions. But again, one would, would need to specify what do you want to lead? That's a good question. Kim, do you want to wrap up a bit the content and then I'll give some next steps to us? Oh, uh, just uh, saying that, uh, again, it's not the tools that uh, drive the change. It is the leadership of the people. And I think we are now at the moment where the leadership should take over and uh, empower the people we, we have. And, and uh, the tools should support that. Uh, not saying that uh, it wouldn't be important, as Mikko said, with uh, big data and analyzing that, but still the human factor. I believe in it, and I believe in good leadership of the people. So, um, as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, there are two webinars that will be still upcoming during, during the autumn. Um, for the ones that are still present, save the date. It seems the following one with Carla Giardinetti, who is the founder of the Global Good After COVID-19 movement, seems to be on the 2nd of October. But we will post more information about this later on for you. And in November, we will have Professor Eero Vara from Said Business School, that is a part of Oxford, um, talk about a paradigm shift within leadership. So uh, we are really tackling this topic and, and starting with this RE and strategizing point of view has been very interesting. There's also a new article in Harvard Business Review, the Italian version, where they are talking about this initiative and there's some really interesting information there. I will put up some, some of this on, on both this event's web page, seems to be that we probably need to start talking about good during, which is what Juha well addressed during this webinar. Please feel free to contact us at any time if you have any suggestions, any wishes, anything that you would want us to address or address or talk about. We are very grateful, especially to our speakers, Nikpo and Juha, and of course Petri for giving the insights again on the survey with, with a focus on leadership. But it has been very interesting for us as well, and, and especially I am learning new things all the time. So a big thank you to all of you and I see that we have the camera on so we can wave to everyone and a big thank you to the participants without you it wouldn't matter <laughs> so we're glad to have all of you here we wish you a wonderful start of the week positive thoughts and let's keep identifying the good things <laughs>